from Carl. Sorry. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> so today we're excited to welcome Carl um, Bottiger. How do you say your last name, Carl? Uh, Bettiger, but yeah, Bettiger. people say everything. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, from the Ecological Forecast Institute. And um, he's going to help us start a conversation about um, forecasting um, metadata standards, um, which I know that conversation has already started, so we can talk more about that. Um, before we jump into passing it off to Carl for his um, presentation or, or lay of the landscape for EFI, um, I wanted to open it up for any cluster and ESIP related announcements. Um, so, anybody have any? events that they want to share or just important things that this cluster should know about coming up. I don't have anything coming up, but I will share the link to the ESIP summer meeting videos just because I think this is our first meeting back since then. So thanks. Thanks, Jim. Well, Excitingly, it sounds like we already have a date for our winter meeting too, so we can start thinking about that. Um, I will also plug that a week from today, exactly a week from today, we're going to have another cloud computing cluster session, um, and Jim, we can get together about sending out that announcement today, um, but we want to have sort of a working session on, um, you know, providing any advice or consultation that we can to the NASA transform to open science um, program as they start to develop their curriculum. Cool. All right. Well, unless there's anything else, welcome, Amelia. Annie, did you have any ESIP announcements? Uh, nothing for me today on the announcement side. OK, cool. Um, sweet. All right. Well, I'm going to pass it off to Carl. Carl, are you ready? Yeah, sure. Uh, all right, let me just put some slides up. So this will be super informal. Um, I just wanted to take this chance to, so thanks for inviting me. I'm looking forward to kind of sharing the things that we've been doing over on the ecological side. And I think we have kind of at least as much, if not a lot more to learn uh, from your community. And uh, I think we both benefit just by kind of comparing notes on these workflows. The sort of two big themes I'm tackling here is the, so the use of metadata and what those metadata standards look like. And what does it mean to kind of move those workflows into something we might call a cloud native environment, uh, or cloud native setup. And so that's the kind of two themes I'll be touching on here. And this is stuff that has come together relatively organically over the past two years now from the Ecological Forecasting Initiative's uh, NEON Challenge. And I'll say a little bit about what those acronyms are in just a moment. Uh, this is a collaboration that really has benefited from a pretty big community. I have listed that Quinn Thomas has been really my co-conspirator in a lot of the sort of mucky details you're gonna see here, but there is kind of a much more organic, larger community that really has underlied the experience that we're, we're building up here. So first, many of you may already be familiar with NEON. NEON is the National Ecological Observatory Network. And you can think of it roughly as kind of the ecological equivalent of kind of weather observatory stations. Um, they measure all different things. There's over 182 different data products, so everything from counting ticks and beetles to measuring overall CO2 flux or changes in water quality. And I'll talk a little bit about which of those products we're gonna focus on. Uh, it's been up and running for a few years now, um, depending on particularly which site you focus on, but has you know, roughly a 35 year operation window and a $469 million budget at current. So it's a pretty big scale project and ecology has certainly never had anything at the scale before. The, the key things here being that the data is collected consistently in a standard format at, across all of these different sites and across all of these different variables for like a really long time, which is just pretty transformative uh, for our field. And it really has, for one thing, opened up the door for us to be able to say, can we get serious about making predictions, about making forecasts. So like any field ecologists have talked about forecasting for a long time, but we don't really do it. Uh, that is, we don't often put our predictions about the future before that future arrives and we can see that we were right or wrong. Um, and of course, there's a great opportunity to learn about what we do and don't know uh, the more that we try to make those predictions. And there's a 
much bigger opportunity for those predictions to really inform decisions once we get confident that we can actually make the decisions in a meaningful way. Um, and a part of that is communicating what we don't know as well, understanding the uncertainty uh, in, in our predictions. When are these forecasts reliable? When are they not reliable? And again, how do we sort of communicate that uncertainty to both other researchers and decision makers? So to kind of start uh, catalyze thinking about these problems. So FE is the Ecological Forecasting Initiative. You can think of it as kind of a proto-professional society, uh, it's sort of a grassroots organization of just a bunch of ecologists that are interested in the idea of making more forecasts, making forecasts operational, actually sharing forecasts. And it has really kind of leaned in on two bits of that, that the forecast should be iterative, that we want to not just like throw it out there once and just like never do it again, but we want to sort of continually make an updated prediction as we get more information in um, and on a relatively short, short time scale so that you're seeing it, um, you have a chance to actually evaluate like, oh, a year later or a month later, how well did I do? Uh, it's, we've organized this using the NEON data into five sort of big themes. One is phenology. You're basically predicting like when the leaves come out on trees at the largest scale of a, of a process uh, across the US, but focusing on individual um, the different species will green up at different times in response to different temperature variables or whatever it might be. Moving up uh, to ticks, we're forecasting abundance of ticks. This involves the individual population dynamics. You have some population structure of the juveniles and the adult ticks that can both be identified in the sample. Going farther up the ecological organization hierarchy, beetles, uh, forecasting the overall beetle community dynamics, the species richness, and the abundance of beetles that are caught in pitfall traps. Uh, over to aquatic indicators. So a bunch of sort of very standard indicators like um, temperature and oxygen, um, as well as some chlorophyll measures in rivers and streams at different neon sites. And to the largest level at terrestrial biome, looking at uh, latent evaporation and also at CO2 flux measured from the, from the flux towers. Um, and so those are the five different themes. They all have different natural time scales, different kind of specialist challenges involved in them. And uh, the data comes in at very different frequencies from uh, both the terrestrial and the phenology data, we can now get at a daily interval, sometimes even more frequently. Uh, whereas beetles, by the time they have uh, verified all of the species identifications, the latency on that can be up to two years, even though the, the individual sort of raw counts we get somewhat more frequently at the sort of monthly scale. So different time scales, different processes. Um, these challenges are just kind of out there for the community. And we've had a bunch of different teams start submitting over the past two years. Uh, challenges are in kind of a dual mode where we kind of advertise them and try to get a bunch of people to submit at the same time and submit hopefully multiple forecasts. But they're also kind of a rolling basis where you can kind of throw in a forecast at any point and it becomes part of that collection. Uh, so over the past two years, these five themes have 12 different variables within them, cover 52 of the NEON sites. We've had 54 different models submitted. Um, each model usually represents a different team, though some teams will submit multiple models. Um, many of them are iterative, so there's many more forecasts than models, over 2,000. And my number is a little bit out of date, but over 2,000 models and over a million individual observations. We try to synthesize that and score that and provide a visualization back to the teams. Um, and so this creates, there's all kinds of challenges in doing this process because this is not how we normally do ecology. So ecologists, we tend to just all work in our own special systems with our own special formats, with our own sort of private knowledge of those things. And if we make predictions, we kind of wait till we get the values so you can publish the paper and say my predictions were right. So it's very hard to kind of compare ahead of time how well forecasts have done or compare forecasts from two different groups in a really objective way. And it's also very difficult to kind of scale this process up to the level of NEON data. We're used to working in you know, data that like one research team can collect by itself. And so there's just much smaller scale data. So as teams try to do this, there's all of these barriers to how do I kind of get up to the level where I can produce a forecast, actually automate it, and actually have it run with this sort of massive flood of data now coming in from NEON that uh, as ecologists, we're not used to dealing with. And so, Designing a cloud native infrastructure is both kind of a curse and an opportunity there. Of course, there's big opportunity to make it much easier for workflows to scale up. But if those workflows feel like completely different to what ecologists are used to doing, you know, then we're just kind of off in a parallel universe and they won't touch anything we're doing. So we've tried to build a system that kind of is 
takes away sort of the complexity bits as much as possible and provides something that is as familiar as possible to ecologists that they can start building forecasts that can scale, that can be run automated, that can be compared against each other in a, in a relatively straightforward way. Uh, the first kind of core concept for us was to understand kind of how are we going to manage the data? How are we going to manage the storage? Uh, centralizing around basically a, a bucket-based architecture, having everything be on something equivalent of an AWS like S3 bucket. We're actually using uh, sort of a different system um, where we're using mostly MinIO, which is kind of an open source uh, version of AWS S3 to host our buckets. Um, but same idea that there's kind of a centralized place where you can put the data and all of the code that needs to operate on that can work directly against those buckets. Uh, I'll take kind of a deeper dive into exactly what that means. And excuse the kids, they're just getting some, some games out while we're here. Um, okay, so what we need to do, each of these little arrows is some piece of the workflow that needs to be able to run and needs to be able to run the sort of cloud native infrastructure where it can basically just kind of be a GitHub action or be a Lambda function, something that you can kind of toss off, run, gets from the different resources, for instance, from Neon, all the information it needs. And when it's done running, it's pushed up all the data, it's processed into the bucket where it's now sort of globally available. Um, and so we try to run these different little bit of pipelines that take Neon's data, which is relatively sort of decentralized into you know, millions of different little small CSV files um, that can be sort of a high friction tool for ecologists to work with when making these forecasts into sort of a combined infrastructure. Same with NOAA, we wanted to be able to use weather forecasts, but you point people, and I'll dive into that one in a moment here, to the, to the grid forecasts files and people like, what is this and why are there so many of them? So I'm gonna do this kind of backwards. I wanna show sort of what we want to be able to give the users and then sort of how we get there. This may seem very obvious to many of you, so apologies, I'm telling you things you already know. It's definitely been new to our community. Uh, a couple p key pieces of technology, I'll come back and emphasize this again later, have been um, libraries like Arrow, which work both in Python and R and many other languages that make it very easy to have this kind of computation against a remote data resource. You don't have to download everything to your computer and have to take up a huge amount of space and wait forever and then do your calculations and then download it again the next day. You can just kind of work with it directly where it is. So here, this is our bucket that we are hosting. Because we're not using um, AWS, I need to give an endpoint override. And it just says, use our own one, which we've called data ecoforecast.org. That's just the MinIO server. And there's just a path, right? It says, I want the GEFS version 12. So the global ensemble forecast system from NOAA. We have processed it to different levels. We'll talk a little bit about that later. So this is the simplest one. And I just say, open this data set. As you may know, if you've used Arrow before, this is a, a lazy operation. There's not a huge amount of data that suddenly has to transfer over the network. It's just a pointer saying, I'm ready to start working with that data. And I can immediately start filtering whatever sort of chunk or subset I want of that data without first downloading the whole product. And so here I say, I want forecasts produced on a particular day. Maybe I want to look at only one ensemble and so forth and so forth. Exact same structure in Python, uh, syntax is not, perfectly identical, but it's almost a copy and paste, right? And so again, you're just using PyArrow. And so we can support sort of most of our community is still in R. We have a growing community in Python. And uh, if we had people working in other languages as well, it's nice that there's arrow bindings for them as well. So this is to, instead of the kind of working with the raw resource here to get to that, as you may know, if you've looked at the guest forecast, there's like 6,930 assets that are coming out every day because each one of these little assets, these, these GRIB files, uh, there's one for each ensemble, for each forecast interval, and then you get kind of the whole um, globe in one individual file. Uh, we only care about a handful of the variables in that. I think there's some yeah, 85 different variables in any GRIB file. This is the metadata that you see from, uh, from NOAA. And so we want to say, I just want a couple of those bands, like we really want precipitation and temperature and humidity, things that might be useful ecologically, mostly the surface level measurements. Um, using, um, I'll jump ahead here. So using a, on the spatial side, GDAL, this is kind of our other sort of Swiss Army knife equivalent for the spatial structure data, particularly for these 
uh, raster files to say, I just want to extract the bands I need. Again, I don't want to download the whole thing and read twice. That works only so well with grib files because they weren't really built for this, but you can at least now extract the bands with the GDAL uh, 3, 4 or more recently. Um, and then our little script is, says, I can now subset that data to the location of any one of those 81 neon sites. And I don't need the whole globe. Uh, I don't need all of that extra data being produced every particular day. And so then we can provide this kind of subsetted spatial information that we're then accessing this way. And so here, our ecologists can just have kind of copy and pasteable our Python code that says, when you get those back, I didn't show kind of what the return object here is, but it looks ready to go in terms of forecasting for the particular neon sites and the particular variables of interest. Um, talk a little bit more about how you kind of stick those bits together in a moment uh, when we talk about metadata, but just to kind of summarize uh, elements of those workflows, I think they're kind of two sort of concepts or technologies we really tried to wrap our heads around here. Um, moving to processes that are under the hood, they're doing like curl range requests. They're doing, don't download the whole file the way we used to and then subset the file on local disk, but you know, send the request over the network that says, I just want this bounding box. I just want those bands. I just want these dates. And so the user can use a language of subsetting they already know. They're not learning kind of a new framework. They're not learning a new API. We're not maintaining custom API code with a custom SQL server that has security vulnerabilities and needs to be updated. You know, it's just working directly against this very standard sort of S3 API that's already built for us in Arrow, right? And then there's this, Adopting that is what I like to call the sort of post POSIX file system IO. You may have seen, like, I think it was about last year, there was a popular theme going around on Twitter about how like kids these days can't find things on their own computers and they don't understand file systems. And I think this is partly a problem for us as scientific programmers. We tend to just assume that when we're writing code, it's always operating IO on a POSIX file system. The files are essentially local and that we know where the files like really are and a lot of cloud native architecture just isn't like that anymore, right? It's you're operating against an object store like S3, you're not operating against a POSIX file system. And some formats are like Parquet work really well in that environment and some older formats also do like CSV and some older formats also don't like NetCDF and the Gribs and things. So, so the, being able to move our data storage first, kind of solve the storage problem first was a big step into being able to kind of design the rest of these components so that they would be kind of modular and that we could run them anywhere. And we didn't care like which computer was responsible for say downsizing the NOAA data and which one was downsizing the NEON data or subsetting it and um, how the users were being able to access that data. Okay, so putting them back together, we get to take care of these workflows. We still need our users to write the code here, the crucial code that says, create a forecast and create it sort of in an automated way, perhaps using these updated informations about drivers and the updated information about what I call targets, meaning the thing I'm trying to predict. And of course, after some delay, we can compare those targets, the, the new latest measurements to the predictions and we can create scores. And it's very important to us that these scoring system can accommodate probability. As I said, kind of uncertainty is a key concept here. You can squint and see that in our little visual dashboard that these big bands of uncertainty are a key part of the forecasts. And we use strictly proper scores, again, barring from the climate community, things like CRPS and the log score to say, you know, in probabilistic terms, who's making the best predictions and show different ways to visualize that. So we need a way to kind of allow this exchange to happen with every team producing its forecast in its own way. And so doing that meant we need a common language to describe forecasts. And of course, that's the role of metadata. We saw some examples with sort of how the files are laid out, say, for Noah, who's obviously been doing this for a long time. And we, we see a couple of things that are kind of unique to forecasts that aren't true of actual observational data. You know, our world of data management has so often focused on like real data, obviously, right? And real data has only one time scale, essentially, right? Like when that observation was made. And forecasts are fundamentally have at least two time scales, right? There's the time the forecast is made, and then there's the time it is made for some point in the future, what we sometimes call the time horizon, um, or what in our language we have called the start time when I made the forecast versus the time the forecast is for. 
you can see that NOAA has called that forecast valid. And in fact, I've highlighted this case because forecast, it's, it's a little bit more subtle than that. Sometimes that's a particular time. You know, this is the component of wind at that particular moment. But for rainfall, this is accumulation over some interval. And for snow, this is an average over an interval. Sometimes it's a max or minute. So, so there's almost a third notion of time there, which is that sort of interval averaging that you want to capture for some variables, but not others. Maybe that's part of the variable definition. Maybe you turn that into rate. I'm not sure. We've focused on sort of two notions of time. Uh, so there's some more familiar things like site ID or XYZ that you're sort of the spatial component that you're tracking. Uh, most of the FE forecasts are done at the level of any on site. So it's just an ID and which model is making that. Um, and then there's describing the uncertainty. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So NOAA, for instance, is using ensemble forecasts. So the guest forecast produces a 31 member ensemble. Each one is a different stochastic run as well as an average. And so that's sort of another layer of dimensionality that you have. And then of course you have the variable that you're trying to predict. So you, all of these different variables, for instance, and the actual values of those. And so how do you kind of wrangle this into a structure that everybody can agree on? So we have started with sort of a tabular structure where these are columns and something like parquet. And then on top of that, put a metadata model where being ecologists, we built on EML. EML is a you know, two decade at least old standard. So of course it predates some of the nicer new stuff. It's based in an XML metadata standard. And it's extensible, uh, which is great. We were able to build a little XML extension for it to say we want to describe some of the individual model complexities, because as forecasters trying to do kind of iterative forecasting, build that on models, we really care about that stuff. Uh, can I describe uncertainty? Can I describe, you know, did this model just use historic values of beetle numbers to, for future values, or is it using weather data at all? I kind of want to capture that like big picture structure. And I also want to know sort of what's the model and data provenance, sort of, you know, how frequently was this model updated? And, you know, did that changes in the model lead to better forecasts? Or is this something else that has caused the accuracy to suddenly improve or, or to suddenly go down? Um, and of course, email already supports the standard authorship publication metadata stuff. Uh, it also more or less is a language that's not super machine readable, but at least lets us describe sort of what it is we're talking about in terms of the units of these measurements, the variable definition, the blah, blah, blah. Okay, unfortunately, email is very cumbersome as an XML format, particularly for ecologists who haven't even heard of XML, even though we've used email for a long time at like large scale projects. Individual labs have often ignored it. So Neon, for instance, provides EML data. Some of the big data repositories use it to describe their data. And it also wasn't built for forecasting. So it doesn't have like the dual time scale notion. And it doesn't have the notion of you know, uncertainty as ensemble or probabilistic descriptions. So Stack, as you know, has become increasingly popular, particularly for distributing spatial data, though again, focusing on observational data. So this provides a really nice way for users to identify uh, geospatial assets on a range of different cloud providers. And that kind of distributed structure is also very inspiring to us as forecasters, because we don't want to be think of this as building just what like FE Neon Challenge looks like, but kind of what would forecasting look like more broadly? And could someone just kind of search across different catalogs of forecasting challenges and compare those forecasts and so forth? So that's very appealing. It's built on this very sort of lightweight, very user-friendly JSON structure of metadata. So easy to deploy, it's easy to maintain, and it's pretty easy for users to actually do something with. Uh, so there's been an ongoing discussion even before I got there. I think Tom probably introduced me to that first on what a stack extension would look like describing forecasts and dealing with some of these things like that dual time structure I keep on saying something about. Um, and you know, just last week, uh, there's now a preliminary uh, stab at what this might look like. And I think this is worth kind of attention from the rest of us as a scientific community saying, great, can we use this? And also what, is it, what does it not have that we still need in order to, to describe forecasts? Um, and kind of avoid in a way, you know, we've been trying to solve it at the ecological scale, say, let's kind of all choose some standard terms, but really the problem is bigger than that. And we don't want the ecological community to kind of get siloed into some sort of archaic terms and archaic metadata that won't allow us to communicate and benefit from tools being developed sort of more broadly from the rest of the community. Um, and so this seems like a promising way to standardize on that. 
Um, and I've also put some links here to some additional discussion threads, as well as the now sort of emerging issues here that are discussing. So we'll, we can we can pop back on that. I'll just kind of wrap up. The one other kind of thing we're thinking about looking forward. Uh, so the stack model is still very metadata driven. So you say like, I want an asset that has particular start time. You filter that in the metadata and then you get a particular file that's specific to a forecast produced on that day or a specific to ensemble member uh, you know, one, right? And that's very granular in terms of assets, right? You're in that world of the 6,000 some GWIB files, right? Because the individual assets are basically those, you know, two-dimensional rastery things that we're most familiar with. You don't have to do that in stack. It's just kind of how it's designed, I think. Um, we're also looking at what the forecast is really this kind of higher dimensional object, right? Instead of having like time and, you know, X, Y, and maybe Z, we have the double time scale, and we also have this uncertainty scale. And for us, we have teams that produce uncertainties in ensembles and teams that produce uncertainties that say it's Gaussian with a mean invariance, or it's log normal, or it's, you know, whatever the family might be from a probability distribution. And you can think of uh, the uncertainty as being kind of additional discrete bands. We've described that as terms of what we've called a family. So you would say this is a normal distribution, or if it's an ensemble member, you would say it's a sample. And then in the case of a sample, your parameters are the ensemble ID. In the case of normal, your parameters are, say, mu and sigma, right? And so you can have this high dimensional object in something like an XRA structure or a ZAR structure. In old school, you did this in that CDF where it could have arbitrary dimensions, not just the two spatial or three spatial dimensions, not just cubes, right? And the nice thing about this is now the user can kind of control what subset the slice they want, right? Kind of the same way we were doing with Parquet, where you can say, uh, you know, I want to filter by whatever the columns are, whatever the values are in the data itself, not have that second metadata layer on top of it. I think there is some stuff that will never kind of be in the data that you still need a metadata layer for, but I think there's something to think about sort of, and there's some impressive examples in, uh, weather forecasts that use these higher dimensional SAR structures to let you sort of say, these are just the pieces you want. Uh, I wanna stop there and kind of open it up to, to broader discussion. Uh, thanks to all of these folks uh, and everything more or less that we've done is under our eco forecast organization here. Nice, thank you. Um, we actually have a bunch of questions, but we do have half an hour, so I'm, thinking that we could just go through them one by one, if that's okay with everybody. Does anybody, um, did everybody get a chance to add questions to the document or did they wanna raise a hand if they have a question and I can add it? Okay, so if you wanna add a question, feel free to add it to the list. Um, I'll probably, call on people to read their questions so that we get a little bit more participation from the group. Um, but I'll start with my question, which is um, sort of a noob question, I guess, which is what does timing of green up mean? <laughs> You're, there are literally cameras that just kind of watch the landscape, the forest or whatever, and they count how many green pixels they see. So, you know, generally we think of phenology as the problem of predicting the timing of uh, the seasonal events um, of any particular organism. Could be when birds choose to nest, could be when flowers come out and so forth. But the easiest stuff to measure at scale is like count the green pixels. Um, and so you can literally see at the different sites kind of the arrival of spring. Uh, we've also started predicting redness. So just count the red pixels in fall. Of course, it's not quite as sharp as the green curves, um, but yeah, you're forecasting these transitions. Cool. Um, the second bullet is somebody know who that is, or should I should I read it for them? Just wait for a minute. I think that might have actually been me, Amy. So I was I was going to ask. We, I know we've got more than a few people from NOAA here, so uh, maybe actually, did you take you... some tips? Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. So if you did add questions to the doc, or you're adding questions to the doc, could you put your name by them? so that we can ask for people to speak up. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, so I was, I was just gonna ask, this, this sounds like a pretty similar problem to what Noah tackles. And I was wondering if you were looking for lessons or if you had taken some lessons and which, which ones you found most valuable. 
Yes, 100%. I think we are looking for many more lessons and we have we have cribbed heavily from the things that we see in NOAA already. Uh, just to highlight a couple, I think w one of the things that's just been fantastic has been the discovering that NOAA has the AWS buckets, particularly for all of the old historical forecasts. Um, when someone's calibrating a model, it's really useful to say, I, you know, I don't, you, you think you want to say, I can use real measurements from, you know, 10 years ago, five years ago to know what the rainfall was at that neon site. But it's actually useful to know what NOAA had forecasted because they're a different resolution and so forth. They can differ systematically. And if you're using the forecast as the drivers, it's useful to kind of be able to back check that. And so discovering, hey, look, there's just, you know, terabytes and terabytes sitting here on AWS and we can, because it's AWS, we can sort of use these range request strategies and just pull out the bits we need going way back. And if something happens to our processing, we were using the ones that were up on the NOAA servers, but they live there for like four days or something, and then they're gone. And, uh, you know, our, our CI wasn't robust enough to, to keep, you know, not create gaps that way. So, so yeah, having the buckets, having the long-term archive was, was huge. Uh, there are challenges, of course. I mean, no one needs to support these legacy formats like Grib, but Grib is no fun. <laughs> you know, it's a it's it's a source it's a source of friction, and the, and there are more modern formats that could could be could be easier. And so, just to tag on to that, so having the having the access in S three buckets is huge, both because the data is just available, and because um, you can use these range requests. That being said. What are you know? What are your challenges still with working with that forecast data? Yeah, I mean, it's it's still really big. It's still stuck in gribs, and so it's big and and, and but broken into the uh, sort of million assets, right? Which isn't a huge problem, but it's you know it's a it's an extra curveball for um, for us to work around. Um, I, I can say more about that, but I maybe that maybe that's familiar already. Yeah, Somebody. could I? Uh... Could I just follow on that? Um, that you know, we've we spent a lot of time on these calls talking about crude chunk. You know, um, do you think like having these grib files, like for for Jeff's uh, or Gaffs, is it Gaffs or Jeffs? I don't know. <laughs> There's real um, no people here. I should keep my mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, would it be worth you know while having like um, some of these virtual, you know, data set representations of the grid files through like different, you know, best time series at tau equals zero, one, two, three, or something like that, or, or I mean, would people find that useful or? Um, format would be useful. I don't think best, if I understand you, for, for us, it's, we like the uncertainty because we don't know, you know. Oh no, yeah, I just meant like the different forecast hours, like, you know, the different I mean, I guess actually we could just put it all in one. Like, why not just make the ensemble another dimension um, in the yeah per precisely data I think, set? Yeah, right, right. So if we've got in in language like the way that Arrow supports that filter, right? I can just our users already are use are familiar with using filter to do SQL like filters, right? Of just mm -hmm. saying like I want this band, this blah, this this. Before we had to either go through Noah's like online system that kind of gave us that like API to say, you could tell us kind of what's spatial subset you wanted and what, you know, in our language and we'll run it on our server and return it to you. And that was slow and, but worse, it was also a learning curve that like there's a special syntax, right? Yeah. And with like GDAL, right? It's just the same crop command that people were using locally, but now it's a way to subset even before you download. And they can just say like, you know, read raster, throw viscurl in front of it and then pipe it to the crop function and it just extracts just the bit they need. There's like mm -hmm. no new learning and like already the tools just kind of run and, and, and they run at that performance scale. Right, so for so for Python users, I think the analog would be use X-Array and do your subset on the Kerchunk data set. And then you have no, you know, you have no GDAL or anything, actually no native reader at all involved, uh, which is as, as efficient as you can get. So, so quick question, Carl. I, I think like, you know, I wanted to circle back. I think I, that's why the reason I talked about the grid. I, I try to wrangle around a lot with the grid, right? The way it's formatted kind of weird, right? Because when the grid was, in, you know, developed, they never thought about the cloud itself, right? So, but like, you know, as a part, so I'm, a, I'm from the weather service, but the grid is like one of the, our bread and butter for the, especially this is a requirement from the, our WMO, right? Because it's a WMO standards that we need to follow 
whenever we make any data set available, it's our requirement to make a grid as a one of the data formats to our user side. So we're stuck with it. But I, I but like, you know, I, and I know we've been having a challenge with you know, consuming the data from the grid because the way it's stacked, right? But I saw like, a, I was just curious to see what ways you found, you know, based on your work, like in how to optimize, like with the, what we get from, you know, the data in the, in the, in the cloud that you have in the grid. And what's the, I'm interested to hear a little bit your perspective on that actually. Yeah, great. Well, I mean, first, I completely agree and support the kind of commitment that it has to that sort of stability, right? It doesn't, you know, Grib's been around for a long time. There's a lot of tooling built on it. You don't do the community any favors by like forcing them to move faster to new formats than they want to move, right? Um, but other than that, like other than the, the huge, very non-trivial storage costs, um, like the, 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 it's not a, maybe not a huge lift to do these little pipelines that are just converting the serialization. To a, to a cloud native serialization um, that just let us take advantage of a couple more tools. Like the one thing we, it's nice that GDAL has built in support for the bands that with the newer, so I can just download the bands I want from, from Grib, but I still get the whole earth map. And so I'm doing a little bit more data transfer over the network than I need to. Um, if I first translate that into a cog format or any other like format that I can then do my, my spatial subsetting over the network, I can transfer a lot less data and the pipelines just sort of run a little bit faster, uh, particularly for my users that are, that are network limited. Um, but that's, you know, that's almost minor optimization sort of around the, around the edges, like having it already on the, the AWS bucket system is already sort of a big, a big win, it kind of opens the door there. They, the user can still write the same code. The only problem is it's slower, right? And, and that's really the wins for us. It's like when there's as little change as possible for our end user, the change is done like sort of under the hood. It's by the people who are maintaining for us, it's the raster and Terra packages that we use in R, which just happened to bind the GDAL C libraries under the hood. And the GDAL people worry about the connection to the cloud and the R user doesn't even know it's happening, right? It's just kind of magic. Uh, thanks, Carl. I think I would like to extend a little more, one more question on that. Like, you know, it, it would be really helpful for at least from a weather service perspective to see if there are any recommendations how to optimize some of the use cases, right? Like, you know, converting the whole grid data into a different format. They, there is a you know associated cost, you know, for, for government to look at it. But we'll be very interested to get some sort of like a feedback, okay, because now the data is already in AWS or in any cloud provider. What are the possible ways, you know, to optimize? You know, it may not be as optimized as the other cloud optimized formats, but is there a way to sort of like a, have some sort of more optimized way to consume uh, that data set for any analytics? Analysis will be very valuable feedback actually. We'll appreciate yeah, that. It's, it's a great question and others may have ideas that go far beyond, but that we saw this fantastic example for the, the high resolution NOAA forecasts being put into, into ZAR by, I've forgotten her name now, there is a researcher uh, PhD student, I think in Utah, um, we're seeing an increasing example. I'm going to call Tom can speak to this of just like, and it, people, particularly on the commercial side, sort of reserving uh, NOAA data sets, but ecological data sets, data sets that otherwise sort of have been out there, but are been like really high friction and not mobile onto things like planetary computer and onto these cloud-based services that are much more mobile. And part of that has been just kind of dealing with some of these formatting things. So that that example with the high resolution uh, weather forecasts in SAR, it's just, it's really beautiful in that like suddenly you can kind of do all of your subsetting without, you're not parsing the file name on a grib file to like figure out what slice or dice you want. You just, you have that N dimensional object. You can just sort of say, I want, you know, these ensemble bands at these locations at these times and not at those times. And you can just kind of slice just the bits you need. And it really makes the data just a lot more mobile and a lot more kind of the user friendly and developer friendly. Cool. Well, and we you. see scientists when they don't have that, they just, they take, they don't, they don't use the data at all or they take shortcuts. Like they'll use one ensemble member and we're like, why the heck did you use one ensemble member? And they're like, well, the grad students spent six months doing this and that's as far as they got, right? And you're like, okay, I understand. Like we, we live in the world too. Mm -hmm. No, no, I mean, totally, right? It would be really cool if there's a way that you guys can share the feedback or even the use cases 
for some solution use cases to our community that we can bring it back to other service that really phenomenal feedback actually if there are some use cases that you know some of those solutions that will be cool actually so i'm gonna pass it to rob to make sure that um we sort of get everybody who has a question a chance to ask one. Oh, thank you <clears throat> i think this actually dovetails to the discussion that was always going on i wanted to touch on um the the range gets that you're that you're using um, do you experience any issues in terms of scaling, like perhaps in a parallel sense, you might you might take advantage of, you know, doing multiple fetches in parallel. Does this represent any challenges for you when using range gets? It probably does. We were initial for a while. So we're cheap and like resources that are provided like by NSF and things. So we were using uh, we've done most of our computing on Jetstream 2, which is a sort of a university hosted cloud like system on OpenStack rather than AWS, because AWS would charge us money and also charge any us money anytime any user downloads that data. Right. And so it's been great to be able to run this whole thing on an open source stack on, on NSF. They have a Ceph based system. Some of you may know, um, and Ceph is like, again, uh, like a, a Red Hat product, does really nice storage um, and also provides the S3-like interface. But whatever the scale, um, the reverse proxy they had in front of their Ceph requests thing, we just kept breaking it when with parallel requests. So they were, it would accept like a thousand requests or 3000 requests or something from an IP. And uh, yeah, that went badly. So they, we kept on just getting rate limited on the, the range request. We weren't actually pushing the Ceph's backend performance. It was just getting through that front end. We have a like a small virtual machine running a MinIO instance that we just don't put any, you know, uh, proxy up in front of or minimal kind of traffic. And it and it has handled the parallelism just fine. Um, and so we're still wrapping our heads around those things as the as the answer, but uh, they're they're real challenges to understand. Uh, yeah. It depends a little on the libraries too. Again, you can probably all tell me more about that. Like some of our libraries, like we're not writing the get request range is like ourselves in curl, right? Like ours at C library is using like Amazon's SDK to do that. And it does it really well. And there's some R packages that do the same thing and they are manually creating the curl requests. And sometimes they're inefficient about handles and they do it terribly and they crash the machine more often. So there, the parallelism is there. I kind of hope other people solve the problem for us. You know, there's good yeah. incentive to do that. And, and it sounds like you mentioned before that this kind of helped with the buy-in for, for users to feel like they could go cherry pick things instead of having to try to be efficient and, you know, grab only one box instead of, you know, multiple boxes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Sean, you're next. Hey, yeah, this is kind of, I think, more of a joint question for, for Tom, Rich, and Carl, and, and maybe focus more on Tom and Rich and anybody who's been building index archives of forecast data. Um, do we have a like consolidated way or a, a standardized way of representing some of this multi-temporal information for for forecasts? Um, is there something within the CF conventions that describes like how we should be structuring the, you know, the lead time and the intervals um, and the different temporal parts of, of a forecast in a dimension and, and naming them correctly? Or have we just been doing this kind of an, an ad hoc like per forecast product way? And if we're, if we are, is, is there, um, is there a standard that we, we should be uh, adhering to that, um, you know, would make life easier for, for users like Carl. Uh, Rich or Carl might know more, but I'll put in the in the notes a link to one of the issues in the in the stack extension, forecast stack extension, where Aaron Spring uh, put some links to CF conventions touching on this sort of thing. So I think it's mostly been covered by CF conventions, but I could be wrong. There might be stuff that's missing. Rich, how about for you, for, for somebody who's been, or, or yeah. I guess Tom too, for I like- I mean, I, yeah, I don't have anything. I think I think that's correct. I don't think either, I don't think I have anything to add there, except that the, um, you know, for a long time, we used to access these through the forecast model run collection that Unidata Unit, Unit provided on their thread servers. So they, I think though, that the CF convention is pretty much just consistent with that. Okay. And then Tom, for having built, like, have you only built Kerchunk indexes for forecast data or have you actually like restructured forecast data with different 
dimension naming. Um, and if you have like, are using a common approacher, you just um, using what's what's existing in the in the data. Um, I'll have to double check, but I think I've not successfully done uh, Kerchunk for forecast data, at least not from Grib. Um, so that's still uh, something that we're figuring out or that I'm figure, trying to figure out, I think. Sweet, thanks. Okay, I, I did put in the notes the um, the her example that for Kerchunk that does use Grib was just recently updated. So if you want to go check out how to do Kerchunk on Grib files, you can you can check that out. It, it actually there were some pretty uh, impressive speed ups and uh, and then the API changed a little bit. So if you have an old one, <laughs> uh, if you have an old one, you probably have to update it. The Kerchunk API. Um, okay, so I'll go back to the beginning of people who ask questions, which starts with me. Um, so I wanted to know, going back to sort of what I originally sort of thought we were going to be talking about during this meeting was was stack as well. So I'm wondering, um, and I know there's already a proposed stack extension um, and some discussion going on there. So I'm, I guess I'm just question for the group, like, where are we with that? It seems like basically we're still in a discussion phase for deciding what the stack forecast extension should look like. And I guess to answer a follow up question to that is like, what is or is there a prototypical use case for forecast data that's driving the metadata standard? I think that okay. uh, you're good. Oh, I was just saying we're uh, we're paying Matthias to work on uh, uh, GEFS, I think. And so Matthias likes stack and stack extensions. So I think that is the concrete reason that he is uh, looking into this. <laughs> Yeah, I think it, it's synergistic to, to us as well. Like I mentioned, we have this kind of clunky metadata model, right, in, in email that basically there are systems like the Arctic Data Science Center uses with, um, I forgot what it's called, Metacat or whatever, where you can like have a stack like API search for metadata fields, but it just does, it, it feels like it's very somewhat more niche and also doesn't have the active development that's over here on the, in the stack community for the observational data. And we're doing something that is in many ways very similar. There are some unique twiggles on the forecast side, but like if you want forecasts to be sort of more widely discovered and consumed and compared, that structure seems like the right kind of thing and on a layer that we don't have, right? So we're hoping that we could put a stack catalog over our forecasts. Currently, like, unless you want to parse XML, like your ability to explore the forecasts is just like, connect to the S3 bucket. There's no like search thing. You can just like have the data frame there, the, you know, see all of the forecasts, but you can't like have that extra metadata layer. So it'd be easy for us to put us, that seems like both a, a flexible and an active development place. But if we're jumping into that, like we don't want to do it alone. We kind of want to build on what other people have already done. Right. So it sounds like Tom, like Matthias is moving forward with GF, GEFS and hopefully people might be able to like follow that example if it makes sense. Like what I'm wondering is, is it, is it an expected use case where somebody would want, you know, to compare forecasts from two different models or two different stack catalogs. And so we need these conventions that we need these standards to be. Not yeah. Yeah. I think that's the hope. And then was it in the notes that you, you put Amy, like it, it'd be, yeah, the weather. So like, hopefully all this, like, yeah, you know, the weather forecast is a driving example here, but yeah, hopefully it can work for the longer term climate forecast as well. I don't know to what extent it will or not, but hopefully uh, that'd be great if it if it does cover both those domains. Yeah, it would. Although I, I mean, I'm not I'm not really heavily embedded in either weather forecast or climate modeling. However, my understanding is that those two use cases are pretty distinct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so. If there's overlap, uh, hopefully, hopefully. If there's overlap, uh, great, but it might not be yeah, a need. Yeah. For driving yeah. Force. Um, did anybody else have questions that would they want to pose to the group? 
some of these, Carl, I'm hoping maybe you could take a look after and also answer them async if we don't get to everybody. But um, if not, I'm just going to go start going down the list here again. So um, Jim, do you want to ask your question about end users? I'll go ahead and let someone else tackle that unless unless no one wants to talk and then we can end on a slightly philosophical note. So well, you I think that's that's super interesting to me. I mean, I think one thing I didn't talk much about, but we've spent a lot of effort on is like the probabilistic nature of forecasts. And, you know, we have end user means different things to us. There is an end user as as the ecologist researcher who feels perhaps very removed from questions of cloud and metadata. Right, but wants to know if they're like correctly representing uncertainty on some sort of deep level and sort of where is that uncertainty coming from? Is it coming from measurements? Is it coming from the model? Like where does more accuracy get into the model? Um, and then there's a communication challenge to, to that, right? There's an end user who is not a scientist, but is maybe decision maker. And how are you correctly communicating and kind of putting the forecast at their fingertips? And I think that's oversimplified as well. We have a, you know, rich sort of community of nonprofits and so forth and, and now government agencies that might pay attention to forecasts too where they're very technical expertise um, and may be wanting to consume the forecasts um, but need to kind of understand what's going on there and so ways that we that we handle all of that are a little bit open questions but we're really hoping that like we can come up with a way for instance describing a forecast a probabilistic forecast that kind of works across those communities the weather examples is very ensemble based and often small ensemble based, for instance, and some of our end users push back on that and they're like, you need the full, like, I'm not going to have a thousand member ensemble, you need to have a support for these parametric structures as well, uh, to properly characterize these sort of long tail distributions or whatever. And so, for instance, having a structure that can both support a log normal probability and an ensemble member is, is very important to us in terms of the infrastructure. Sorry, Sorry having, maybe I just took that in a random direction. Having a support, having a structure that can support both, which are the two that you categorize? Yeah, what I call parametric forecasts, they'd say like the uncertainty is log normally distributed. So I'm not supporting like this is a, the measurement or my predicted value or my expected value. It's not any of those things. It's like, this is the variance, the sigma, and this is the mu, or this is the lambda, like that they're just, param you're forecasting parameter values of a distribution. And you can express it in the same structure um, if you're if you're careful about it, we've seen some nice tooling that has done that um, on the our side. For instance, there's a forecasting library called Fable, which is emphasizes probabilistic forecasting. It's widely used in the econometrics community, but it has sort of seamless switching between sample or ensemble distributions and, and parametric distributions. Okay, so it's parametric versus ensemble relative. Yeah. Um. Right. Okay. And then. Oh, I guess my question was just in terms of communication, you know, at least at the metadata level, it sounds like we don't have a proposal at this point, but it could be useful to somehow represent you an end user community. What is the certainty in this forecast or represent that there is some uncertainty and like, how do we do that? I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what I kind of left unsaid is that if you if you have that kind of metadata agreed upon, it's much easier for someone to come around who specializes in visualization tools and kind of build like, this is a way to visualize uncertainty and compare forecasts in a visual like user-friendly format. And like, we can kind of all benefit from that like visualization development if we're all using kind of the same sort of standard structures to begin with. Otherwise, we're just all kind of reinventing the wheel and banging our heads against those problems uh, one by one. Cool. We've seen some cool dashboards where we've been able to like steal from other things and be like, oh, once we agree on the standard, we can use this dashboard, for instance, to look at uncertainty in some of the ecological data. We were able to put that same dashboard over the, the NOAA predictions. We could just say, I can look at neon measurements of rainfall NOAA predictions of rainfall and use like this ecologist's visualization tool to say, you know, show me the uncertainty and the accuracy of those predictions over the next 30 days. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that'd be, it'd be great to see that example if you have it handy. Um, yeah. I guess since we're almost at the top of the hour, um, 
I know that you're looking something up now, but I'm just wondering. Yeah, I'm listening. What's next for your work? I think figuring out the a stack format for the metadata and having a stack catalog for our forecasts would be would be fantastic. Um, I'm hoping we are building off of stuff that other folks are doing and we're not actually the ones writing that, we're just kind of using it. So we're kind of just watching those repos and joining the discussion. Like they've definitely latched on to the timescale thing. There has been less than discussion so far about ensemble or other measures of uncertainty. This is just a quick example of taking a dashboard that was built for the ecology challenges and just saying, once you have a standard format, it's easy to take relative humidity measurements that were made by NEON in one weird format, forecasts that were made by NOAA in a GRIB format and present them on the same dashboard um, at each of the NOAA sites. And you can see some sites very predictable and other sites kind of weird. Um, this was like a, undergraduate student working with me. So this is a relatively quick and dirty dashboard, but we, I think it gives kind of the flavor. Cool. All right, well, I think that's perfect timing. Um, I have to hop off, but if anybody wants to stay and continue the discussion, of course, you're welcome to, I think, I don't know, Jim, you also have to, if you also have to hop off, then I think the meeting would end, but yeah. Nope, I can keep it running for a few minutes if we want to keep talking. Cool. Well, thanks, Carl. And uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, thanks, everyone. And hope we just keep talking about this stuff. Go ahead. And thanks very much.